geology is a fairly young science, only around 200 years old, but the Earth has four and a half billion years worth of history recorded in its rocks. So there's still plenty of mysteries left to solve, and I've got one of them right here, the zebra stone. Hi, I'm Brooke and I'm a geologist and I'd really appreciate it if you take a moment to subscribe, like the video and share it with your friends because there's going to be loads of fantastic geology and fossil related content coming at you over the next few months. I first came across the zebra stone a couple of years ago when I was on a field trip to Darwin, Australia with my PhD advisor Rosalie. We visited the Mindel Beach night market where there was a stall selling items that had been made from the zebra stone. We had never seen anything like it, so we asked the owner how all the stripes and spots were made. We were pretty surprised when he told us that it was a natural rock and he had no idea how it formed. I was absolutely bamboozled, but keen to see if I could work it out. And that's been one of my side projects alongside my PhD for the last few years. The zebra stone is from a small area of the Kimberley region of Northern Australia on the border between Western Australia and the Northern Territory. The original outcrop of the zebra stone has since been turned into a reservoir, but there's still plenty of rock in the subsurface that people dig up and quarry to use as a decorative stone. Uh, it's easy to see why. The zebra stone is part of the Ranford Formation, and it's a sedimentary rock formation deposited in shallow coastal and river plain environments in the late Cryogenian and early Ediacaran periods, about 672 to 600 million years ago. People have suggested all kinds of explanations for the stripes and spots you find in the zebra stone. Some people have suggested that these are traces of microbial colonies. Some people have suggested that these are even fossil jellyfish. And some people have suggested that these are sedimentary structures or diagenetic structures that have nothing to do with living organisms. There's surprisingly little information in the scientific community about the zebra stone. So which one of them, if any, is right? So let's have a close-up look and see if we can work out how the zebra stone got its stripes and spots. <laughs> Why is that even funny? So let's describe what we can see with our eyes. <clears throat> We've got these red spots that are kind of ellipses. And if we turn them on the side, we can see that they're stripes. So they're like tubes going through the rock. can also just make out that there's lots of teeny tiny, very, very thin laminations, little lines, very thin beds running through the rock. And you also might be able to see where the stri this stripe here follows the laminations, that they're kind of wavy. There's also fractures that run at right angles. These red spots are in this cream coloured matrix and it's too fine to see if there are any grains in it. There's actually red material all over but it's mixed in with this white material. You can also see that the ellipses kind of have this smeared appearance. It's like the bottom of the ellipse was pulled this way and the top of the ellipse was pulled that way. That might have something to do with the fact that the, uh, that the rock is, is kind of has this undulose wavy form in it. It's been slightly deformed by continental movements. You can also see here we've got these red spots that are smeared between individual, tube, individual spots and they also move upwards. We've kind of got these ghost spots. So it's like whatever the red material is, it looks like it's getting pulled out of the rock and concentrated in these spots. And the fact that they're overprinting laminations that have been compacted already and squashed means that these spots probably appeared after the rock has turned to stone. The same goes for the fractures as well, and the fractures are actually full of the red material. So what do we know from previous videos? What can we, can we have a guess at what these materials might be? In other rocks we've looked at, red-brown material like this has turned out to be hematite or some other iron oxide. And this cream stuff, notice how it has this conchoidal fracture? It shatters like glass. That means that it's mostly made of the same material. It's homogenous. And so this could either be all made of, this could be chert, could entirely be made of uh, microcrystalline silica, 
or it could also be made of microcrystalline clay and all one kind of clay. But to really understand what's inside this rock, we're going to have to slice it up and stick it on the petrographic microscope. So let's do that now. Okay, here we are on the petrographic microscope. See what we can see. Straight away, we can see that the lamina are split up into two kinds. There are granular lamina, this is definitely a granular rock, and then there are lamina that are too fine to see. Some of the lamina are filled up with that red material, it doesn't have any pleochroism. Switching to XPL, the red material stays red. It's very fine flakes, pretty much confirms that that's iron oxide, probably hematite. So let's look at one of the granular lamina. No pleochroism, no fabric or texture inside it. It's greasy grey, it's going to be quartz, we've seen it before. The extinction that sweeps across the grain is called undulose extinction. It means the crystal lattice has been placed under stress and the easiest way to do that to uh, the whole rock is by tectonizing it, which is what we suspected. Let's see if we can zoom in on that ultra fine material, creamy grey white stuff. We're going to have to go in right to our highest magnification. No pleochroism, switch to XPL. There's a weak extinction and then they have this pale orange colour. And we can kind of see that the grains are kind of platy and flaky, clay minerals. And with clay minerals we've seen before have really bright colours. And this one has a, a really weak orange colour. And that probably means it's very rich in silica and it's very poor in metals like aluminium or potassium. So I suspect that this is china clay, more correctly known as kaolinite. And that's basically just aluminium and silicon oxide. And this one looks like it's really low in aluminium and really rich in silicon oxide. And the fact that it's got so little aluminium in it means that this rock has probably been leached. And that's where a fluid passes through the rock and pulls out metals. So things like aluminium and potassium. And while that was happening, if that rock was also full of iron and the fluids were oxidizing, you get a lot of iron oxide produced. Iron oxide is really soluble, like I said. And if that was happening while the rock was being fractured and tectonized, you would have a really porous rock with lots of conduits and channels for fluids to pass through. Okay, so let's go and have a look at some of those red areas now. We can see that red material completely cross-cuts, goes across the bedding. So these red patterns aren't a primary feature. They've come thousands or hundreds of thousands, even millions of years after the rock was deposited and after the sediment was turned into a rock. So that rules out sedimentary structures, either jellyfish fossils or microbial structures, and leaves us with diagenetic features. We can also see that the fractures cross-cut the laminations as well. So they definitely came later, probably during or just after the deformation event. Increasing its porosity and its permeability. So porosity is how, how much space, how, much, how many holes there are in it, and permeability is how connected those holes are. So with just some simple observations, we've been able to reconstruct a lot of the history of this rock and work out what was going on in Northern Australia 600 million years ago. It's pretty cool. These kind of kaolinite rich silty claystones developed along the margins of rivers where you're getting seasonal flooding and then loads of sediment gets washed out onto the sides of the river banks. So 600 million years ago in Australia, there were no plants. So these clays would have just been able to build up. So we've now collected a lot of primary observations and data. Let's put it all together and see if we can come up with a story for how the zebra stone got its stripes and spots. We know the rock was originally a hematite and silt rich clay stone, the kind of thing that might be deposited on the banks of a river when it floods every season. We know that after the sediment was compressed, that it was deformed in a tectonic event. Fluids passed through the rock during deformation and that remobilized and moved around all of that hematite. The minerals in the rock separated due to something called immiscibility. So think about oil and water separating. It was okay when they were deposited, but now they've got all these high pressure fluids passing through the rock, the minerals separate out. The hematite, which is highly mobile, and that means that it dissolves really easily, formed into these channels, and that probably represents where the high pressure fluids were passing through the rock. Fluid regime changed over time. And that's how you get those ghost spots there, where you get, it looks like they're smeared out. So even though this rock looks fairly smooth and solid and compact to us, on a microscopic scale, it's probably full of holes. 
You probably, you probably can't see that, but my tongue is sticking to this a little bit. And that means it's full of microscopic holes and a force called capilla reaction it makes it feel sticky. Zebra stone's a fairly simple rock. It's only really got three ingredients, but it's still pretty spectacular and tells us a lot about important parts of Earth's history. What did you think of the zebra stone? Or have you seen any weird rocks you'd like me to describe? Let me know in the comments below. In the meantime, I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe, like the video, and then share it with your friends as well. And if you want to talk more about rocks and fossils, use the links in the description below to catch me on the various social medias. Until the next time, see you later. Take care. Bye-bye.